Okay, welcome everybody to our last uh, DTM seminar for this year, academic year. Um, I'm happy to welcome Laura Schaefer. She's a, um, currently a postdoc at Arizona State. She, um, in the School of Earth and Space Exploration. She got her BA from Washington University of St. Louis, uh, her PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from Harvard, and is starting a faculty position at Stanford uh, next year. Um, her research topics are pretty amazing. They span <laughs> from atmosphere of the early Earth, ocean formation and planetary thermal evolution, and core formation on super-Earths. So almost everything. <laughs> We're going to hear about some of that today. So go ahead. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, Peter and Alicia for inviting me to come here and give you this seminar. Um, and I apologize in advance, I have a little bit of a head cold, so hopefully I won't lose my voice by the end of this talk. Um, but I want to tell you uh, about today is about some of the work I've done looking at core formation, in particular metal and silicate uh, partitioning, um, its influence on uh, core compositions, especially for exoplanets, and then uh, talk a little bit about mantle oxidation state and its evolution during the magma ocean stage. So uh, here's a quick outline of where the talk's going to go. So I'm going to start with uh, core formation, and I'll give it a little bit of a background um, for, for people who aren't familiar with, with how these models work, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, light elements in the core and the bulk oxidation state of, of a planet and how that influences the mass and radius diagram. And then I'll talk about the um, switch from bulk oxidation state to focusing particularly on the mantle oxidation state. Uh, in particular, thinking about um, iron 3 plus relative to iron 2 plus, um, how iron 3 plus is produced, and how it fractionates as the magma ocean crystallizes. And then um, my particular interest in this is, is on the influence on the outgassed atmospheric composition uh, from the mantle oxidation state. Um, and then if there's time, which there probably won't be, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how the atmosphere itself might actually be able to oxidize the mantle um, as well. Um, so here's a little brief overview on core formation models. So we think that, that core formation is happening at the same time as planet accre accretion um, when, uh, and it happens at many scales, so from planetesimals all the way up to larger planets. Um, and it might happen slightly differently on these different scales. So in smaller bodies, we can get um, some amount of melting um, due to uh, short-lived radioactive isotopes. And that can lead to at least partial melting of the object. And that would allow the iron to start to separate, or the, the metallic phase as a denser phase, to start to separate and to sink towards the center of the body. Now, we might have only partial melting, and so we can potentially have metal ponds forming at the bottom of the magma ocean. Um, and then uh, in smaller bodies, we might be able to get percolation, which is just metal uh, flowing through sort of the pore spaces and, and these grain boundaries of silicate material. But this is only going to happen um, uh, at certain pressures. And once you get to high enough pressures, it seems like this uh, uh, mechanism might shut off. In which case, we might end up having something like metal diapirs. So you have this metal layer forming, and it will eventually drip off and, and drain into the center of the object. And this might be gradual, or it might be actually, uh, some recent models suggest this might be more catastrophic, where the whole layer will overturn relatively rapidly. But in any case, what we have is we have two separate phases here. We have the silicate and the metallic phase. And they are in contact for at least a little uh, portion of the accretion time scale. And that can allow some amount of equilibration to happen. Um, and so um, what we can do is, is try to look at the compositions of the silicate that we can actually probe and use that to try to probe the conditions under which core formation are happening. And we do that through, using, uh, through modeling using partition coefficients. So this is 
um, a simple schematic for what a partition coefficient is. This is the Nernst coefficient where we have the relative abundance of an element in the metallic phase uh, relative uh, to the abundance in a coexisting silicate phase, sort of shown by this schematic equation. We, we have the metal reacting with oxygen. Um, and these are experimentally determined for the most part. And they are dependent on both temperature and pressure, uh, as well as the, the composition of the system. Um, now, in, for modeling, uh, it's actually much easier to, to try to eliminate this oxygen uh, term from, from this reaction. And so often we'll look at, uh, instead, exchange reactions, like this one down here. So instead of reacting with oxygen, this is reacting with iron. Uh, as the dominant phase or dominant element in the carrier phases. So we have metal, iron metal reacting with the element in the silicate, and this uh, converts it into the element in the metal uh, and iron oxide in the silicate. So by looking at the relative abundances of these, um, we have this uh, exchange coefficient. Um, these are the products of the activities, and then, of course, the activity is just the mole fraction of that species in that phase times its uh, activity coefficient. So we have experimental measurements of this, and we can use that to try to uh, probe, the again, the conditions, particularly the temperature and pressure at which core-forming uh, materials equilibrated with the mantle. Um, so this is work from Rebecca Fisher. Um, and in particular, the we're looking at trace elements in uh, the Earth's mantle, um, and looking at how their partition coefficients vary as a function of pressure and temperature. So nickel and cobalt become more siderophile or more metal-loving at higher pressures and temperatures. And so we can try to look at, uh, if we assume a bulk chondritic composition for the Earth, um, we can take the composition in the mantle and infer what the composition or how the abundance of those elements in the core. Uh, and then try to use the partition coefficients to constrain the conditions at which uh, the metal and silicate equilibrated. So this is a result from Rebecca Fisher. It's for sort of a single stage um, core formation model where we're assuming that the entirety of the silicate mantle equilibrated with all of the um, metallic core. And that gives us this average condition for equilibration uh, in this region between the solidus and liquidus for the silicate. And that gives us pressures at which the uh, equilibration happened between 45 to 55 uh, gigapascals um, within the magma ocean. Now, we know that there are elements other than uh, just these trace elements in the Earth's core. Um, and we know that from measurements of the density of the core from seismic velocities. So this is um, the density of the core from the preliminary reference Earth model. As a function of depth in, depth in the outer core, you can see this jump here is for the, uh, for the inner core. And that's compared with the uh, equation of state for pure iron. So there's, there's two equations of state shown here. Uh, this one's from Anderson and Ahrens, and this one is from uh, Koma Bayashi in 2015. So you can see that there is a significant offset in those densities. Uh, and this orange curve is for iron containing about six weight percent of oxygen. And that matches this model for, or this uh, density from Prem a uh, much better. Um, so we can see that this deficit, uh, this density deficit must be made up uh, by the core containing elements that are, are lighter than iron. And these elements have to be um, cosmochemically relatively abundant in order to make up uh, this deficit. So um, models predict somewhere up to about 10 weight percent of this lighter element. And the usual suspects that are um, uh, assumed for this are hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, sulfur, and silicon to account for this deficit. Um, now, sulfur was probably the favorite for a long time, but it, uh, sulfur is not really abundant enough in the Earth to make up this entire deficit. And so in the more recent literature, oxygen and silicon uh, have really become the, the leading contenders here for, for this light element. Now, other models for core formation 
um, do more complicated uh, equilibration models. They do multi-stage core formation where we have the planet growing relatively gradually uh, as it's accreting um, pre-differentiated uh, pre objects. So this is sort of state of the art from Dave Ruby. Um, and what he does is he takes in-body simulations, which are shown in this figure on the right. Um, each of these rows here is a different in-body simulation. Um, and it's sort of, they're sort of reproducing the terrestrial planet architecture in the inner solar system. So we have a Venus, we have an Earth, and, and some kind of Mars-like object. And these simulations are tracking where the material that's accreting onto these planets is coming from in the solar nebula. So the brown material is coming from 0.5 to 1.2 AU. The green material is coming from a little further out and, and so forth. Uh, in some of these, you can see there's a little tiny sliver of material that's blue, <laughs> uh, but it's hard to see. And so what they do in these models is assign a composition to the material from different regions in the solar uh, nebula. Um, and this is uh, an example of, of that, where they are trying to fit the composition of the Earth's mantle and core um, by varying some of these parameters, such as, as where these steps uh, occur in the solar nebula. So uh, what they're particularly changing is they're assuming an overall bulk chondritic composition, but they're changing the relative abundance of oxygen that's being accreted onto the planet by changing the fraction of iron and silicon that are coming in the form of metal versus in the form of silicates. So here, um, iron here is fully reduced, so it's completely in the metal phase at, uh, at these heliocentric distances. And as you go further out, the iron becomes mostly oxidized. So the, as the planet starts to accrete more of this material from further out in the solar nebula, it becomes more oxidized in these models. Um, so they track a number of elements, uh, both in, in the mantle, uh, in order to match the, the observed abundances, particularly of the trace uh, siderophile elements in the mantle. And then they also calculate the core composition. So uh, for instance, this is silicon. Um, at the end of the simulation, there's about eight weight percent silicon in the core. And then for oxygen, there's about half a weight percent uh, at the end of the simulation. Uh, this break here um, is where material from the outer solar nebula starts to be accreted onto the planet. Uh, prior to that, there is only material coming from this sort of inner region uh, where material is more reduced. Uh, so that's why we get this drop off in the silicon abundance in the core. Now, um, in comparison, um, uh, this is the sort of the state of the art right now in exoplanet mass radius diagrams. So we are assuming for exoplanets that we're observing that they have similar internal structures to the Earth. Um, so on this figure, you, you're all probably familiar with it, but we have mass relative to the Earth on the x-axis, radius on the y-axis. All these points are planets that we have found around other stars. Um, and then the lines are, are sort of compositional models where we've calculated the internal structure uh, using, reusing these equations and some assumptions for uh, the equations of state. Uh, so for instance, this red line down here is a model where the entire planet is made out of metallic iron. Um, there are phase transitions included, um, but, uh, but there are no silicates here. So, and then there, this is a, magnesium, a pure magnesium silicate planet, again, with phase transitions included. Um, this is from, these particular models are from Li Zhang. So the magnesium silicate is basically fitted to the Earth's uh, mantle. So there's a, a sort of an olivine upper mantle and a perovskite lower mantle. Um, and then it sort of extrapolates to uh, higher pressure equations of state from there. And then he's assuming uh, pure metallic iron for the core. Um, and that's a very common assumption in most of the exoplanet models. Um, is that you have uh, pure uh, solid metallic iron cores. Um, Carolyn Dorn is doing some additional models where she's using stellar elemental abundances as priors on the composition of a planet. Um, and she's doing sort of detailed uh, mantle mineralogy, but the cores are still solid metallic iron. So these models, um, are generally neglecting the light elements in the core. 
or some of them are using sort of prescribed uh, compositions that are similar to the Earth. And there's good reasons uh, for doing this. Um, one is it's, uh, you can see that the error bars on, on these planets are currently not in the state where we can really distinguish um, between some of these compositions. And the other reason is that the partition coefficients for this metal silicate uh, equilibration uh, are not really known uh, at pressures above the Earth's mantle. So Earth's mantle goes up to about 120 GPA. Um, and most diamond uh, anvil cell uh, measurements stop around 100 GPA. So we haven't really probed uh, pressures much higher than that. Um, when I was at Harvard, though, I was working with uh, Stein Jacobson, and he has started using some shock experiments to try to get at these higher pressures. Because the super Earths that we're finding, their, their mantles might go up to 500 GPA, maybe even a terapascal for the very largest ones. Um, and those sorts of pressures are really not going to be accessible from the static uh, pressure experiments. Um, so Stein's group had done this series of experiments uh, at Sandia National Lab with the ZBL. This is the zero beam lit laser. Uh, which is a high-powered X-ray pulse laser. So what they did was they took these um, samples that are mixtures of dunite and ultra-pure uh, iron metal, so that it is vapor-deposited metal. Uh, so it doesn't contain any light elements to start off with. Uh, and then they shocked it, and you can see the, the crater here in one of the samples. And they find at the bottom of the crater there is melt deposited at the end of the experiment. And there is... Uh, Within the metal, within these melt phases, there, are now, there is now silicon and nickel uh, uh, based on their measurements. Uh, this figure here is showing the temperature and pressure conditions that the experiment gets up to. So these, uh, the pink and the blue curve are sort of our uh, Huguenots for, for uh, fused silica and quartz. And the conditions for these experiments are shown here in these three points. So there is a three experiments. This upper experiment, unfortunately, uh, the sample exploded uh, on pressure release. So we only have data from these two experiments here. And you can see the, pr the pressure that these got up to was a little bit above 200 GPA in extremely high temperatures. So um, I came in to these experiments about 10 years after they were completed. Um, they, they had all this data sitting around, um, and we wanted to try to use it to calculate partition coefficients for silicon and nickel between these, this <coughs> excuse me, silicate phase and the, and the metal. Um, so, so here are those calculations. So this is the partition coefficient for nickel and for silicon. So the blue and the green points are from literature data. So this is mostly multi-anvil cell and diamond anvil cell experiments going up to, you can see, about 100 GPA. Um, and then the two uh, points from the ZBL experiments are out here at 200 to 250 GPA. So the lines here are different partition coefficient models fit to this kind of equation um, for three different, three different uh, models. So the first is from that Ruby et al. core formation model. The dash is from Rebecca Fisher's 2015 paper, and then the dash dot um, is the fit including uh, these two points out here. So for nickel, you can see that, that at least the Fisher et al. and the ZBL fits are very close to one another. Um, they're very similar. So the nickel partition coefficient isn't really changing once you get up to these higher pressures. Um, and so that gives us maybe a little bit of confidence that maybe these uh, experiments are actually achieving equilibrium. Um, uh, of course, the error bars are quite large, and they might be even larger uh, than we're showing here, um, because the systematics of these kinds of experiments are really not well known yet. Um, for silicon, you can see the, the, uh, the static experiments are showing this trend of increasing partition coefficient up to this 100 GPA or so, and then we get this um, downturn uh, with the ZBL experiments. 
And interestingly, the fit from that Ruby et al. were using in their core formation model actually sort of uh, agrees with that. Um, they were using sort of a, um, a polynomial for the pressure term. So this, if you follow the solid curves, you can see that they're actually agreeing pretty well with the ZBL data. Uh, Rebecca Fisher, on the other hand, found that uh, uh, the best fit that she found did not include any pressure dependence for silicon partitioning, only temperature dependence. Um, so that gives us some very different results when we go to the um, modeling results. Um, and then the ZBL fit, you can see, is kind of, um, we have a positive slope uh, at low temperatures, and then as we go up to higher temperatures, we eventually end up with a negative slope uh, for this partition uh, coefficient. So I'm going to show you now some, or talk a, a little bit more about the, the model itself. Um, so this is basically an adaptation of the thermodynamic model that uh, Dave Ruby used. So we have three exchange reactions for silicon, oxygen going into the metal, and nickel. And then we have a series of four mass balance reactions or equations for the four elements that we're tracking that are going into the core. We're starting off with a bulk uh, chondritic composition. And then we can calculate from this the core composition. Um, and I'm showing you here results for the ZBL data and for the Fisher et al. partitioning model. Um, the Ruby et al. results give very similar uh, results to the, to the ZBL. <clears throat> um, and so what I'm plotting here is the weight percent of iron, oxygen, and silicon in the core uh, as a function of planet mass. Um, so the model determines the, the size of the core uh, self-consistently, um, and we have to assume some conditions for the equilibrium pressure at which, uh, which the metal and silicate are equilibrating. Uh, for this, this particular pair of results, this is at 40% uh, of the central pressure of the planet, which, which for the Earth amounts to about the core mantle boundary. Um, and then we have to assume, again, the starting metal fraction. So in this particular set of results, uh, the iron is coming in 95% in the metal phase, so 5% of it in iron oxide. So you can see for the ZBL results, what's happening is that the, the peak of the light element abundance in the core is happening around an Earth mass, uh, and then is dropping off at, at higher, higher planetary masses. Um, and if this is borne out, then this suggests that assuming a purely metallic core for super-Earths uh, is, is a pretty good idea. Um, on the other hand, if you, uh, the Fisher et al. results are showing sort of a plateau in the light element abundances um, at, abun at planetary masses above about two Earth masses. So we get this um, relatively constant iron abundance of about 67%. Um, in which case, uh, these, these models uh, might have, um, uh, so these, these models for super-Earths would then have, a, have a, an error associated with uh, not including these light elements. Um, so it, it turns out the compositions, um, and, and I would suggest if you're really interested in, in the details of this, you might want to go look at, at our paper, but the compositions really depend pretty strongly on this partitioning model, as you can see here. Um, they depend on the initial metal fraction, the equilibration pressure, and the abundances of the major elements. So they're very, actually, very <laughs> model sensitive. Um, but it turns out they don't make a whole lot of difference in the mass and radius curves. Um, the partition coefficient model and the equilibration pressure, in particular, have, have relatively small effects of about 1% on the calculated radius for a given planetary mass. The more important parameters end up being the um, bulk composition, actually, in, in both stellar ele elemental abundances for iron and silicon and magnesium, as well as the overall oxygen abundance. So in this figure, I'm showing um, three different curves, um, red, blue, and green. You might not be able to see the green at the back of the room. Um, but those are for the stellar abundances of CoRo 7b, Kepler 93b, and Kepler 10b. 
So you can see there is a slight difference between them at this um, higher planetary mass range. So at the higher the planet mass you go up to, the, the bigger a difference this stellar composition is going to make. So, but for Earth-like planets, the stellar composition really doesn't have a very strong effect on the calculated mass and radius. Um, and these are all assuming the same initial metal fraction. The, um, if you increase or decrease the oxygen abundance, this can vary by um, somewhere between 3 to 5 percent of the planetary radius. So oxygen abundance, the bulk oxidation state of the planet, um, is one of the biggest things that we really need to try to figure out how to constrain. Um, there has been some work by another postdoc at ASU, Cayman Unterborn. He's looking at trying to constrain this through, through condensation models and how much oxygen might actually get incorporated into a planet um, for uh, stars that have different magnesium to silicon ratios. Uh, and this is one of those assumptions that people have been using a lot is that uh, the planetary abundances reflect the stellar abundances of the system. But what he's showing here is, is if you start with the Earth's, or sorry, the Sun's magnesium to silicon ratio, uh, you can either decrease it by decreasing magnesium or increasing silicon. And that has consequences for the amount of oxygen that would be incorporated into a planet. And, and the same in the reverse direction. Um, so as you decrease the magnesium, you're going to decrease <coughs> excuse me, the amount of oxygen that would be incorporated into the planet. And if you're increasing silicon, you will be increasing the overall oxygen abundance. And this, of course, is going to have implications for the core mass fraction, um, but, but more importantly, probably the overall planetary radius uh, might vary in, you can see, well, here he is holding radius constant and varying mass. So this is 10% um, almost in mass. Uh, difference based on these different magnesium to silicon ratios. And this also influences the mantle composition <coughs> um, uh, in terms of the mineralogy that is condensing out of the solar nebula. So for these um, low uh, magnesium to silicon ratios, you have a, an enstatite dominated mineralogy with varying proportions of quartz depending on whether you have low magnesium or high silicon. Um, whereas for the high magnesium to silicon ratios, you're forsterite dominated um, with, again, varying proportions of instatite depending on the silicon abundance. So uh, clearly, in order to get a better handle on the mantle and core compositions of these exoplanets, we really need to have a better understanding of the condensation sequence and how that translates into the bulk composition and then, of course, um, in order to understand how those elements are partitioning, we need additional uh, experiments at higher pressures um, in order to, to really un try to start understanding super-Earth's compositions. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and talk uh, not now about the bulk oxidation state of the planet, but the mantle oxidation state. Um, and its influence on the atmospheric composition. And in particular, this, uh, I started thinking about this because there's sort of this, uh, sort of a mystery about the Earth's mantle oxidation state, um, where we have measurements of the oxidation state going back through geologic history that show that it's been relatively constant. Um, from the present day, where most measurements put the oxidation state around the quartz phalite magnetite buffer, we have samples of sort of metamorphosed basalts or mantle xenoliths going back to about 3.5 billion years that suggest a relatively flat oxygen fugacity. The, there have been some recent measurements from, this is Albach and Stagno, 2016, that have found this slight uh, decrease in oxygen fugacity around the time of the great oxidation event in the atmosphere, um, but it's still within about two log units of uh, quartz phalite magnetite. Um, there are some measurements that try to go back to the Hadean from zircons. This is from Trail et al. So they're measuring 
Cerium abundances in zircons as a proxy for uh, mantle oxidation state. And you can see they get this, this pretty big spread, but it's uh, consistent sort of within error of a, of a constant oxygen fugacity. Whereas in contrast, these models, uh, particularly um, these uh, multi-stage core formation models that I've been showing you, uh, put the oxidation state of the magma ocean during core formation at somewhere between iron vostite minus five to iron vostite minus two at the end of uh, core formation. Um, so let's go back and look at those models again. So this is again from Dave Ruby. Um, and here's the composition of the mantle that's evolving with time. So you can see the iron oxide abundance uh, is growing. And we're assuming that all of the iron in the silicate here is in, the, in FeO, so in 2 plus. Um, and the oxygen fugacity is shown here. And that's set really by the ratio of the amount of metals to the amount of FeO in the silicates. And so it starts out at iron vocite minus 5 and then climbs up to iron vostite minus two here by the time the Earth has finished accreting. But once the metal separates from the mantle, uh, the oxidation state of the silicate itself is set by the abundances of iron two plus and iron three plus, um, not by the abundances of metal, which has now been uh, removed from the system. So how much iron three plus was there in the magma ocean? Um, so I wanted to try to calculate this. And so I turned to this model of, of disproportionation. So this is a model from uh, Dan Frost and Wade and Wood back in 2005 and 2006, where um, Dan Frost found that in perovskite or bridgmanite, um, iron three plus can be created from iron two plus through this disproportionation reaction when aluminum is inserted into the perovskite crystal structure. It has to be charge balanced uh, by the iron three plus. If there is not enough iron three plus present, then the iron two plus will disproportionate and create uh, the iron three plus plus a little bit of metal as well. So this model starts off with a magma ocean. Um, there is crystallization of perovskite that creates this iron three plus. Um, and then there's a series of remelting events that will allow this iron three plus to be redistributed throughout the magma ocean. Um, I, I was trying to approach this from a little bit simpler place and say maybe we can do this um, in the silicate liquid. Um, and this is something uh, that Mark Hirschman had originally suggested is that uh, well, if iron three plus is more stable in, in the crystal at high pressure, then maybe the iron three plus is more stable in the silicate melt as well at high pressure. So there is some kind of change in the volume of this reaction at high pressure. So I wanted to try to uh, calculate this disproportionation reaction in the silicate melt rather than in the crystallization sequence so that we don't have to rely on understanding the... Uh, the sequence of magma ocean events that, that went on in order to, to determine how much iron three plus there might be. Um, so we need to uh, come up with a thermodynamic model for this reaction. Um, we have equations of state for, this, for the metallic liquid. Um, it's the silicate melt oxides that we need um, information on, particularly trying to constrain this higher pressure, um, the pressure dependence. Unfortunately, uh, there have been people uh, working on this recently. Um, so this is out of University of Minnesota, Zhang et al, published last year, uh, has measured iron three plus abundance in silicates up to about seven GPA. So prior to that, the highest pressure that this had been done up to was about three GPA from O'Neill et al, 2006. Um, and that's shown here in the black. Um, and then there's also a group um, Dan Frost Group at Bioricious Institute, this is Kat Armstrong, uh, has been working on this as well, and she's gotten up to even higher pressures. So this is unpublished work. Um, I understand that she's about ready to publish it, which I'm really excited about <laughs> um, because uh, she's been working on this for a little while. But what she's found is that there is this sort of decrease in the iron three plus abundance up to about 10 GPA 
And then there is this increase once you get up to higher pressures. So she's gone up to about 22 GPA. Um, I should mention that both um, this series of experiments and this series of experiments up here have been done on basically the same a silicate composition, it's a rhyolite, and at the same oxygen fugacity. So they're using the same oxygen fugacity buffer, this ruthenium ruthenium oxide. Um, so what I've done is taken this, the, the published work, um, and the way they fit it, unfortunately, didn't give me the data that I needed to, in order to come up with a, a model for the disproportionate reaction, so I went ahead and refit it. Uh, and I refit it a couple of ways, but the, but the things that we uh, need to f need in order to, to model the disproportionation are the Gibbs energies of the individual oxides, um, their partial molar volumes, compressibilities, and then uh, activity coefficients. Um, so I'm going to show you results for uh, four different fits, um, just to sort of explore the parameter space of possible solutions. Um, and I'm supplementing this data from Zhang et al. because it's a very limited data set with a lot of data from lower pressures. So uh, in particular, the Lang and Carmichael data on volumes, partial molar volumes from 1987, and Cress and Carmichael uh, found the compressibilities. Um, the Gibbs energy of the Wustite component is really well known because everybody likes Wustite. Uh, the Gibbs energy for the ferric oxide in the melt is not well known because it's uh, almost impossible to uh, measure the melting point of, of hematite because it disassociates on melting. Um, and I'm operating under the assumption that the, the ferrous oxide, the FeO, is a little bit better studied than the ferric oxide, so I'm mostly fitting to, to the ferric oxide. So the differences in the fits are the first two, I'm fitting volumes, compressibilities, and activity coefficients, which are really poorly known as well. Um, and then for the, the third and fourth, I'm fitting the Gibbs energy of this ferric oxide component uh, and using activity models from metallurgical literature where these are a little bit better studied. So this is for the FEO, FEO 1.5, SiO2 system, or ideal activities. So um, this model is now basically an adaptation of that previous core formation model. I'm using these two exchange reactions again, uh, and then solving the disproportionation reaction as well, along with those mass balance equations. So here's the results for the iron 3 plus abundance as a function of pressure. So this is assuming a single stage core formation model. I'm only going up to 50 GPA because, well, the data stops here. <laughs> um, but the average core formation conditions, again, for the Earth are around 50 GPA. So the green curve here is the iron 3 plus abundance you get using the Lang and Carmichael and Cress and Carmichael um, equations of state. So this explains why people have, have up to now really ignored iron 3 plus in the magma ocean is because it's pretty small if you just take this low pressure uh, data and try to calculate how much it is. Um, that's pretty negligible. From these fits to the Zhang uh, et al. data, though, you can see that in contrast, we're getting um, the lowest abundances are at low pressure. And then as we go up to high pressure, we're getting larger amounts of iron 3 plus. So the range right now is pretty uncertain on what we would get for the Earth's mantle. But it ranges from about 1.5% up to about 25%. Um, for reference, this is the range for spinel peridotite whole rock measurements, that's about 1 to 3 percent, um, and garnet peridotites um, range from about 2 to 14 percent. So these calculations show that, um, that within the silicate melt, we can easily reproduce sort of the abundance of iron 3 plus that we might expect uh, in uh, the Earth's magma ocean. And it's very consistent with the present day. So we wouldn't really require any additional oxidation mechanisms following the magma ocean. Once the metal separates, the mantle would be at the present day oxidation state. Um, potentially even higher, actually. If anything, we might have be producing too much iron 3 plus, in which case we might have to think about how to reduce <laughs> the magma ocean um, after core formation has finished. Um, I'm going to really quickly touch on 
Another mechanism that also influences the oxidation state of the magma ocean as it's evolving, and that's the crystalliz crystallization of the silicate itself. Um, and here using partition coefficients for, um, for the elements in the silicate melt, so between crystal and silicate melt. And again, these are, are experimentally determined and dependent on temperature and pressure. Uh, and I'm using the um, mantle mineralogy model from Lindy Elkins Tanton. Um, and what she's shown with her fractional crystallization models for the magma ocean is that as you crystallize the mantle, this is the composition of the residual silicate liquid, you can see that the iron oxide abundance is increasing towards the top of the mantle. So we get um, more iron oxide relative to magnesium oxide and silicon dioxide uh, in the upper reaches of the magma ocean. And what I've done is taken this model and then added in the ferric oxide component and looked at the partitioning of that. So uh, really quickly, here are the, the partition coefficients, unfortunately, are not that well known. They're a little better known for the upper mantle minerals. So iron 3 plus is compatible in spinel, um, but uh, not much else in the upper, upper mantle. So this is from Malman and O'Neill. Um, the garnet and majorite I've estimated from, from sort of, these are again mineral melt partition coefficients and I've estimated these from garnet OPX partition coefficients. Um, perovskite, there, uh, again, because people have been interested in this disproportionation reaction, there have been um, some measurements of iron 3 plus uh, in the perovskite. So I'm sort of estimating sort of a low value here, and then I'll also show you results where I'm uh, tying it to the aluminum abundance in the perovskite. And then Wadsleyite and Ragwoodite, as far as I know, there's uh, been no measurements of this. If anybody knows of any, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. Um, so here's how the iron 3 plus abundance evolves as the magma ocean is crystallizing from this model. So I've held everything fixed. Uh, I'm showing you two curves here for each uh, starting composition. Um, I'm starting with either 1% or 5% iron 3 plus just to sort of span the, uh, a, a little bit of the range. Um, the solid curve here is holding this perovskite melt partition coefficient fixed at 1%, or sorry, 10%. Um, and then the dash line is using the, um, the values tied to the aluminum abundance. So you can see that as we are crystallizing the magma ocean, so this is a full magma ocean on the right-hand side uh, to um, very shallow magma ocean over here on the left, we're increasing the iron 3 plus abundance in the residual silicate belt. And that's either from uh, one to about five uh, times larger than the initial abundance. And so this influences, if there is an atmosphere outgassing, this influences the atmospheric composition. Um, and as I said, this is where my original <laughs> interest in this problem came from. So if we start off with 1% uh, iron 3 plus and allow this iron 3 plus evolution to occur, um, this is a very simple uh, four component atmosphere model where we have hydrogen and water and CO and CO2, and the relative abundances are being fixed by the oxygen fugacity. So as the iron 3 plus is increasing in the melt, you can see we get at the top of the mantle, we get this increase in the water abundance. So we go from a very reduced early atmosphere to an oxidized atmosphere in the very late final stages of this magma ocean evolution. If we start off though with 5% iron 3 plus, then the, the atmosphere is oxidized the whole time. So we just have a water vapor and CO2 dominated atmosphere. Okay, so I think uh, that's where I'm going to end. Um, so just a quick summary, I talked a little bit about core formation models and application to super earths, in particular focusing on the partitioning of light elements into the core, uh, silicon and oxygen. And I really think we need a lot more partitioning data at, at these higher pressures in order to start to probe the possible uh, ranges of compositions that, the, that super Earths might have. And then I talked about this uh, modeling the evolution of the mantle oxidation state as opposed to the bulk oxidation state of the planet. 
and trying to understand um, how that oxidation state will influence the atmospheric composition. Um, so there's, due to crystallization, you can get this slow increase in iron 3 plus that will influence the atmospheric composition as the magma ocean is cooling. And then I also showed that you can produce a lot of iron 3 plus in the silicate melt through this disproportionation reaction. And you can separate that metal out that's formed really easily uh, in the magma ocean stage. And so you can easily produce a lot of iron 3 plus. Um, and the larger, and since this is a pressure dependent reaction, there is the possibility that, that larger planets will be more oxidized uh, in general than smaller planets due to this, um, due to this mechanism. Um, so in the future, I really think uh, one of the things that we need to do to, to really get a better handle on this particular aspect is to try to understand other redox reactions within the magma ocean. So starting to incorporate volatile reactions with the silicate melt and with the metallic phase as well um, to get a better handle on, on how differentiation as a whole is going to influence the composition of the various chemical reservoirs uh, in a silicate planet. Um, so with that, I'll finish up and take any questions you might have. Um, so the way I was dealing with that for the mass radius curves was to, um, so I included a number of different phases in the, cur in the, in the core. So there's a meta a pure metal, a pure metallic iron, sorry, and then iron silicon. And, and for the very high silicon compositions, FeSi9, for which Rebecca Fisher has measured in the equation of state. Um, so there are, um, there are some measurements, but, but Yes, um, I think um, those are values for the solid phase, not for the liquid. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's a lot more work to do on equations of state as well. <laughs> That's true, that's true. <laughs> Um, um, so there, there are, um, there are some, I think, ab initio, uh, calculations for the equation of state for post perovskite. Those are included in most of the mass radius models. Um, I think they don't make a huge difference just because the volume of the lower mantle is typically, you know, smaller than the upper mantle. So actually the upper mantle minerals tend to make a bigger difference in the overall calculated radius than the lower mantle minerals do. I have a related question to that, too. Like, let's say we wanted to make a really high-mass planet without an atmosphere. Right? Um, what knobs do you think are sufficiently uncertain that you could turn in order to do that? Like, would it be possible to fit some of those low-density planets that we know Mm -hmm. with atmosphere lifts? Um, yeah, so for the most part, uh, I think no, um, unless you want a completely coreless planet, which I feel for most of the planets that we have me these measurements of, they're pretty hot planets. Um, and if you're melting a hydrous thing, it's hard to keep the, the hydrogen um, down in the interior. Um, so uh, one, of, one of my favorite planets to like, try to think about is, is 55 Cancri E, which is, um, let me go back to my um, mass radius diagram real quick. Um, so 55 Cancri E is this guy up here. Right, so it's falling right on this magnesium silicate line. So this implies there is no core uh, if you don't want to invoke an atmosphere. Um, this planet is uh, has like a surface temperature of like 
over 2,000 Kelvin. Um, <laughs> so in my mind, there is no way that this planet can be coreless um, just because you know, hydrogen doesn't want to stick around in the lower mantle once you start melting things. Um, so I don't think there's any way to get around having an atmosphere on this, on this planet. Um, uh, the one suggestion I have seen is that if you have maybe it's uh, dominantly molten and then incredibly oblate. Um, so if it's spinning really rapidly, you, something like uh, Simon Locke's Synestia idea for, for the... Um, for the moon forming impact, only on you know slightly smaller scale, so it's it's a could be a very rapidly rotating thing that's that's very oblate, and that might give you a lower density signal. Um, but compositionally, I don't think that there would be any way to do that without an atmosphere. Right. The water will instantly react to that pressure in the mm -hmm. Of course, you can get smoke from that. So, uh, those circumstances, if you're helping something in a, in a beyond the snow line, <coughs> in a disk, mm -hmm. form beyond the snow line, in a disk, highly oxidized. Right, right. Yeah, that is, that is a fair point. Um, for, for, I think most of these planets that fall on or above this line, though, if you take, and this is a big thing, if you take the, the stellar abundances and just oxidize everything, uh, you still, um, I, I, I don't think you can, you can get uh, these low densities. But, but I agree that this, this is definitely a possibility, uh, particularly for water-rich uh, systems that are melting, melting further out. Yeah, so, so it's an interesting thing to, to think about um, a terrestrial planet that would not have a core. <laughs> so, I mean, I agree we need a more uh, a partition data at a high pressure and high temperature. But I do have an issue with the case operate compared to planets, how it compares. Uh -huh. Those models doesn't mean meant to extrapolate just pressure and temperature. So mm -hmm. Right. Right. The temperature range is huge, you know. Take any little bit of the temperature coefficient change and uh -huh. the change is huge. Uh, right, right. I agree. Like uh it is it is hard to hard to compare um these these uh uh, measurements. I, I mean, I think these are, and you should correct me if I'm wrong, sort of the, the, the only metal silicate partitioning uh, coefficients from, or measurements from, from shock experiments. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's another issue. Too. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And I, you know, I think, um, yes, I think understanding the systematics of this kind of experiment are, are going to be really important um, going forward. Um, uh, in, in order to do that, I think we just need to get more more experiments of this type. <laughs> Is Stein doing more? Um, he's talked about it uh, for years, but I don't know if that's actually happening. <laughs> yeah.
Mm-hmm. Oh, I have a, another question for you. We just uh, Right, right. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. No, no. That's 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 very true. Um, um, the so the recent measurements are all in the silicate liquid. So those are not uh, relying on on the presence or on the formation of bridgmanite. Um, so, but but yes, I agree. It, especially for the the crystallization models, the, there is really no no information on ferric iron partitioning. I mean, even for the earth, you know the Majorite, Wazleyite, there's there's very little partitioning uh, data there, uh, you know. So so I am exploring different how partitioning will will influence that. Looking at whether it's compatible or incompatible, um, and for the most part, I still see this behavior where just at least the very last stage liquid tends to be uh, fairly oxidized. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree. <laughs> more more measurements of those would be great too. <laughs> Mm -hmm. If you look at our solar system, ours is the least place. Even some chondrites mm -hmm. are not full of iron. Right. So it strikes me that would be much more efficient. Right, right. Yeah, and and those I mean that that we can definitely um so we can at least you know, using these these more simple models, we can we can sort of you know tell the difference between twenty five and fifty percent iron relative to silicon, uh, silicate. Um, uh, the error bars on the planets are are not really there yet, um, but 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 I agree. I mean, um, you know, uh, accreting more um, more metal rich objects, and and but trying to understand that, I think. Uh, really comes back to um, understanding the condensation sequence, how that varies as a function of the heliocentric distance, and then um, what material ends up in a particular planet. I mean, it's 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 definitely stochastic, right? So, uh, trying to understand that in a systematic way uh, is is tough. <laughs> yeah, Con I'm sure you. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I agree with you, it's such a fantastic good case. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there's definitely a lot of degeneracies with these. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh huh. There's a slot in the afternoon. Introduction was accurate. Was that? Was that? My introduction was accurate. Hi, I'm Priscilla. 